Welcome to the Northwestern University Rotating Resident Curriculum in the Department of Emergency Medicine. This is the Environmental Emergencies Lecture. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to list the symptoms and therapy for carbon monoxide poisoning, list the two major snake families in the U.S. and discuss toxins, list also the do's and don'ts of snake bite management, list the four main mechanisms of heat loss and strategies to change heat loss, and discuss the major bioterrorist threats to the United States today. Let us try to illustrate these concepts with a case. A 34-year-old female was exposed to gas at work that she thinks was carbon monoxide. What is the pathophysiologic mechanism of carbon monoxide toxicity? What are the symptoms? What is the utility of pulse oximetry in the evaluation? How about the utility of blood gas? And what is the treatment of carbon monoxide poisoning? Carbon monoxide represents the number one cause of poisoning death, over 6,000 cases a year. It is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Carbon monoxide binds to the heme portion of the hemoglobin molecule with 240 times the affinity of oxygen. It also inactivates cytochrome oxidase. Certain risky exposures are associated with carbon monoxide poisoning. These include cars, home furnaces, Zamboni machines, monster truck rallies, and water skiing. The number one most common symptom associated with carbon monoxide poisoning is headache, especially a familial or communal headache. Nausea, vomiting, viral symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, seizures, and in certain severe cases, coma and dysrhythmia can occur with carbon monoxide poisoning as well. The half-life of carbon monoxide in room air is 300 minutes. With a 100% non-rebreather mask, the half-life is 90 minutes, and with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the half-life is 30 minutes. Average carbon monoxide levels in non-smokers are around 3%. In smokers, it is around 10%. Toxic levels are greater than 10% generally in non-smokers and greater than 15% in smokers, although these numbers must be correlated clinically. Pulse oximetry should never be used to determine severity of carbon monoxide toxicity. The standard pulse oximeter measures saturation of oxygen at two different levels, oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Carbon monoxide is sensed by the oximeter as oxygenated hemoglobin, and pulse ox levels will thus be falsely elevated in patients with carbon monoxide poisoning. The most accurate method of determining carbon monoxide concentration is to obtain a carboxy hemoglobin level with a blood gas. Note that the PaO2 levels on blood gas will also be normal even with significant carbon monoxide poisoning because the machine measures levels of dissolved oxygen, not hemoglobin-bound oxygen. Further evaluation of carbon monoxide poisoning should include EKG and cardiac markers if there are symptoms or risk factors for acute coronary syndrome. The treatment of carbon monoxide poisoning is to give high levels of oxygen to compete for hemoglobin binding sites. For mild poisonings, 100% oxygen via non-rebreather is sufficient. For severe poisonings, 100% FiO2 delivered via an endotracheal tube and ventilator is indicated. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be considered in certain circumstances, such as with pregnant patients, acidosis, MI, or extremely high carboxyhemoglobin levels. Hyperbaric therapy has mixed outcome results in clinical trials and is not currently the standard of care for most carbon monoxide poisonings. A new strategy being tested is isocapneic hyperventilation. Here, hyperventilation is performed with a gas containing a mixture of carbon dioxide and oxygen. The high carbon dioxide level of the gas reduces the respiratory alkalosis that would otherwise occur with hyperventilation, and the high oxygen competes with and displaces the carbon monoxide from hemoglobin. The high minute ventilation is thought to enhance carbon monoxide clearance. Let us now move on to another case. A 23-year-old man is bitten by his pet snake. Let us try to answer the following questions. What are the two major venomous snake families native to the U.S.? What is the difference in venom toxicity between the two, and what is the treatment and required observation period? There are 7,000 reported snake bites in the United States per year, only five of which are fatal. 25% of bites by venomous snakes are venom-free. There are two major classes of venomous snakes native to the United States, crotalids and elapids. Snake fangs function like hollow bore needles. When the snake latches on, the fangs retract briefly into the venom glands, which function as syringes. The venom is delivered to the victim through the hollow fang via capillary action. The crotalids are also known as the pit vipers, so named for their heat-sensing pits on the sides of their heads. The upper right snake is the copperhead, the bottom right, the cottonmouth, and the bottom center is the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. The bottom left snake is the Mojave rattlesnake. Crotalid venom causes local skin necrosis and hematologic abnormalities. 
Initial edema is followed by bullae formation and ecchymoses. The first symptoms are pain, followed by constitutional symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, paresthesias, and eventually systemic inflammatory response syndrome and DIC. Crotalid venom acts early, so if patients lack symptoms within 8 hours of the bite, no pathologic effects are likely to occur at all. The Mojave rattlesnake on the bottom left is an exception to the crotalid family in that its venom contains a neurotoxin which can cause paralysis. The lapids represent the other major snake family native to the U.S. The coral snake on the top right is the most common elapid seen in the U.S. The king cobra on the bottom left and the black mamba in the bottom center are especially dangerous elapids found in the rest of the world. Elapid venom contains a potent neurotoxin which can cause delayed effects. Symptoms can be absent for up to 12 hours after the initial bite. The neurotoxic venom causes paralysis, respiratory failure from diaphragmatic weakness, and cranial neuropathies. All patients with elapid bites should be admitted to the hospital to monitor for the delayed neurotoxic effect. A non-venomous mimic of the coral snake, the king snake seen on the bottom right, has spawned the popular phrase, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom lack. This rhyme is meant to inform people that the snake with the red bands that directly touch the yellow bands, i.e. the coral snake, is venomous, and the snake with the red bands that only touch the black bands is not venomous. However, this rule is not accurate in snakes that are not native to the U.S., prompting one prominent toxicologist to use a different version of the rhyme, red on yellow, run like hell, red on black, run like hell. The treatment of snake envenomation is more noteworthy for what not to do rather than what to do. Strategies that have been tried unsuccessfully in the past include antibiotics, steroids, heat, ice, tourniquet application, suction, and electric shock therapy. What is indicated is the following, local wound care, tetanus immunization, immobilization of the affected extremity, and antivenin. A local toxicologist should be consulted in all cases of snake envenomation. What a general practicing physician should know about antivenin is that the older, horse-derived antivenin causes an extremely high rate of serum sickness and allergic reaction. The newer Crofab antivenin dramatically reduces these risks. There is a separate elapid antivenin used for elapid bites. We will now briefly discuss spider bites. The spider shown on the right is the Latrodectus mactans spider, or the black widow, so named for the female's propensity to kill and eat the male after mating. Bites from the black widow cause local pain and edema. In rare cases, a systemic reaction known as latrodectism occurs, signaled by constitutional symptoms and abdominal myoclonus yielding pseudoperitoneal findings on physical examination. Benzodiazepines are the drug of choice in treating latrodectism. Antivenin for black widow spider bites is reserved for severe cases and should only be pursued in consultation with a toxicologist. As with most environmental emergencies, mortality is highest at the extremes of age. The Loxosceles reclusa spider, or brown recluse, can deliver a toxin which contains sphingomyelinase D, a potent hemolytic and cytotoxic agent. 20% of bites from the brown recluse spider will cause a necrotic lesion with a black central eschar. Interestingly, this eschar resembles cutaneous anthrax, and each has been mistaken for the other in several case reports. Treatment for the necrotic lesion is purely supportive care. Incision and drainage and antibiotics have only worsened outcomes in several case series. A rare systemic reaction known as loxocelism can also occur, causing hemolytic anemia. A brief mention of scorpion bites will be made here. The Centroroides exilicata scorpion found in Arizona contains a neurotoxin similar to elapid venom. Paralysis and respiratory failure can occur. The Trinitatis scorpion is famous in medical education lore. This is the scorpion bite associated with pancreatitis in a common mnemonic. Interestingly, 80% of bites from this scorpion cause pancreatitis. It is only found on the island of Trinidad. Let us now discuss another case. A 34-year-old man presents with altered mental status. He just finished running the marathon on a warm day. He is confused and responding to questions with nonsensical words. What are your initial diagnostic and therapeutic steps? What is your differential diagnosis? What further testing would you like to do? And what is your definitive management? In the case just described, the patient presents with altered mental status in the setting of extreme body heat production and environmental exposure. The most important diagnosis to consider here is hypothermia from heat stroke. Let us discuss basic definitions. Hyperthermia is defined as excess body heat with inadequate heat dissipation. Unlike fever, where microbial toxins cause a CNS response, in hyperthermia there is no elevation of the hypothalamic set point. 
Hyperthermia can be caused by environmental exposure, drugs, and endocrine pathology. Heat exhaustion is defined as a mildly to moderately elevated temperature in the setting of environmental heat exposure with nonspecific symptoms such as fatigue, syncope, headache, and nausea. Heat stroke is defined as a significantly elevated temperature in the setting of environmental heat exposure with alteration of mental status and the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome or multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. All patients with heat stroke exhibit tachycardia and hyperventilation. The liver is the most sensitive organ to heat stress. Mortality is on the order of 20%. The diagnosis of heat stroke must be made with rectal temperature as alteration of mental status will often preclude patients from cooperating with an oral temperature measurement. Diagnostic studies to evaluate heat stroke include basic labs, coagulation studies, transaminases, urinalysis, and CPK level. CT of the brain with lumbar puncture must also be considered as meningoencephalitis is an important differential diagnosis in a patient with altered mental status and elevated temperature. To explain the management of heat-related illness, we must first discuss the physiologic mechanisms of heat loss. Heat is expelled from the body in four ways, evaporation, radiation, conduction, and convection. Evaporation, or the conversion from liquid to gas, is the number one mechanism in most climates. It is ineffective at high humidities. Radiation, or constant background emission of infrared energy, is the number one mechanism in cool climates. It is the only one of the four mechanisms which cannot be therapeutically maximized to treat heat-related illness. Conduction involves transfer of heat from a warm object, which is in direct contact with a colder object. Convection involves transfer of heat from a warm object to circulating air currents. The ideal strategy for therapeutically maximizing heat loss should focus on augmenting evaporation, conduction, and convection. Treatment of heat stroke first and foremost involves addressing the ABCs. The next order of importance is to reduce the temperature rapidly. The fastest possible method would be to immerse the patient fully in ice water. However, performing complex procedures such as endotracheal intubation, ACLS protocols, and defibrillation would be technically difficult in such circumstances. The best practical method for augmenting heat loss is to spray the patient with mist water and use fans. This utilizes the three main therapeutic mechanisms of heat loss, evaporation, conduction, and convection. Cold packs and cooling blankets may be used while the mist and fans are being prepared. Active internal cooling, referring to cooled IV fluids or pleural, peritoneal, or gastric lavage may be pursued if the active external warming measures described above are not working. Benzodiazepines or intubation and paralysis may be necessary after cooling is initiated to reduce reflex shivering, which would cause the patient's temperature to increase. Future directions for treatment of heat stroke may involve corticosteroids, IL-1 blockers, and activated protein C. Let us move on to another case. A 23-year-old female is found floating unconscious in Lake Michigan in the winter. She is intubated by paramedics and brought to the ED. Her vitals are heart rate in the 30s, blood pressure in the 80s over 40s, and temperature is 84 Fahrenheit. What is your diagnosis and what are your immediate evaluative and therapeutic steps? The patient has hypothermia. Hypothermia is roughly classified as mild, moderate, or severe based partly on the temperature and partly on the clinical findings. Patients with mild hypothermia exhibit no significant vital sign abnormalities. Patients with moderate hypothermia are bradycardic, hypotensive, and altered. Severe hypothermia usually occurs when the temperature is less than 28 Celsius and is generally associated with impending or actual cardiac arrest. The diagnosis of hypothermia should always be made with a rectal temperature. Basic laboratory work should be sent, but note that blood gas and coagulation studies may be falsely normal as these assays are performed with blood standardized at room temperature. The Osborne wave is an upward deflection in the QT interval on the EKG. The Osborne wave, though interesting, is not sensitive, specific, or prognostic in any way for hypothermia. Treatment of hypothermia first involves attention to the ABCs as usual, followed by warming measures. Warming may even be necessary during ACLS protocols, as the hypothermic heart is often resistant to defibrillation and resuscitative medications. There is definite truth to the mantra of, you're not dead until you're warm and dead, 
meaning patients in hypothermic cardiac arrest should be presumed to be salvageable until resuscitative efforts are proven unsuccessful with a temperature consistently above 32 Celsius. Warming measures can be passive or active. Passive external warming involves removal of wet or cold clothing and covering the patient with dry blankets. Active external warming includes warmed or heated air blankets. Active internal warming involves warmed intravenous fluids and humidified oxygen, as well as bladder, pleural, peritoneal, and or gastric irrigation. The most invasive method of warming is cardiopulmonary bypass, but this method is rarely used because of the huge expenditure of resources without proven outcome benefits. An important side note will be made here about therapeutic hypothermia, a new strategy for optimizing post-cardiac arrest patient outcomes. In 2002, the Hypothermia After Cardiac Arrest Study Group published a landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine proving that mild therapeutic hypothermia could reduce mortality and long-term disability in cardiac arrest patients. External blanket cooling was used to induce 24 hours of hypothermia after return of spontaneous circulation. The exclusion criteria were strict. No patients greater than 75 years were included, and only V-fib and pulses VTAC arrest were included. Any patients with hemodynamic instability after return of spontaneous circulation and any patients with coagulopathy were not included in the study. The six-month mortality was 41% in the hypothermia group versus 55% in the normothermia group. The mechanism of therapeutic hypothermia almost certainly involves a reduction in the cerebral and myocardial oxygen consumption. Other proposed pathways include reductions in acidosis, free radical formation, and excitatory neurotransmitters. Let us conclude with our final case. An unknown caller makes a terrorist threat with a biological agent. What are some currently employable bioterrorism agents? What are the clinical findings, prevention measures, and treatments of these biological agents? In 2000, the CDC issued a statement on the biological agents most likely to be used in a mass terrorism attack. These agents were deemed to be Category A, or the most dangerous agents, because they were the most easy to obtain, to make into a weapon, to disseminate, and to cause morbidity and mortality among large groups of people in a short amount of time. The Category A agents include anthrax, tularemia, pneumonic plague, smallpox, botulism, and the viral hemorrhagic fevers. We will discuss each separately in the next few slides. Anthrax, the most likely of all the Category A agents to be weaponized, is caused by Bacillus anthracis, a gram-positive facultative anaerobe. Anthrax causes dermatologic, pulmonary, and gastrointestinal manifestations. Cutaneous anthrax is depicted on the top right picture. Note that the appearance of the lesion is very similar to that of the brown recluse spider bite and has been confused with this entity many times in the reported literature. The pulmonary form is the most likely manifestation in a bioterrorist attack from spores released into the air. The clinical picture is that of a fulminant pneumonia with hemorrhagic mediastinitis as a characteristic pathologic mechanism. Chest radiographs can demonstrate a widened mediastinum because of this. The incubation period of anthrax is from one week to one month. Hence, prophylactic therapy with a fluoroquinolone is instituted for one month. Other therapies include doxycycline and penicillin. Advanced pulmonary anthrax carries a very poor prognosis, and only early treatment can improve the poor outcomes. Tularemia is caused by Francisella tularensis, a gram-negative intracellular coxobacillus. It has six clinical forms, including an ulceroglandular form, as seen on the upper right picture. The bioterrorist threat comes in the form of the pulmonic form, which is clinically indistinguishable from a severe pneumonia. Tularemia is extremely infectious. Only 10 bacteria are enough to cause clinical illness. This property is what makes tularemia a dangerous bioterrorist threat. Although mortality is low, morbidity with a tularemia outbreak would be high. Treatment involves an aminoglycoside, doxycycline, or fluoroquinolone. Pneumonic plague is caused by Yersinia pestis, a gram-negative coxobacillus. Aerosolized pneumonic plague can cause rapid acute respiratory failure. The mortality of pneumonic plague is 100% if no antibiotics are given within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms. Treatment of pneumonic plague involves streptomycin, doxycycline, or gentamicin. Smallpox is also known as variola major. It is a double-stranded DNA virus in the pox viridae family. 
It is currently not found naturally and is confined to several laboratories around the world. During the smallpox outbreaks in modern history, one out of every three who contracted the illness died. Chickenpox, or varicella zoster virus lesions, may appear somewhat similar to smallpox. The key distinguishing characteristic is that smallpox lesions are all at the same stage of development, whereas chickenpox lesions are a mix of maculopapules, vesicles, and crusts. There is no treatment for smallpox. Post-exposure prophylaxis and vaccination are the only methods of control of this deadly virus. Botulism is caused by Clostridium botulinum, a gram-positive anaerobic bacteria which forms spores. It inhibits presynaptic acetylcholine release, causing a descending flaccid paralysis. The treatment of botulism is supportive care and antitoxin. There is no role for antibiotics in these patients. We will not discuss the specifics of the viral hemorrhagic fevers such as Ebola and Marburg. For the purposes of this lecture, it is sufficient to know that the clinical manifestations and mortalities of these viruses vary widely. Although they are not easy to weaponize, supportive care is the only proven treatment for all. Here are the summary points for the environmental emergencies lecture. Do not rely on pulse oximetry to assess carbon monoxide poisoning. Instead, use a carboxyhemoglobin level. For snake bites, crotalids have cytotoxic venom and elapids have neurotoxic venom. The four mechanisms of heat loss include evaporation, radiation, conduction, and convection. Spray misting with fans is the most practical treatment for hyperthermic patients. Hypothermic patients in cardiac arrest are not dead until they are warm and dead. And the category A agents for bioterrorism include anthrax, smallpox, tularemia, botulism, plague, and the viral hemorrhagic fevers.